Hello everyone, welcome back to the arcade. Welcome to part three. In this episode, we're going to be talking about how you can use a 3D scanner to scan the side profiles of an arcade cabinet. Sit back and enjoy. All right, I want to start out with a quick overview of the scanner. First off, I need to clarify that I am a true novice in 3D scanning. Uh, the technology has come a long way since I experienced it in college many, many years ago. I looked at a bunch of different scanners that are out there at the moment, and I wound up choosing the Shining 3D. While I have looked at a bunch of scanners with it, the reason I wound up choosing this one is much more that the company has a history of developing 3D scanners, more on the professional side of the market. From what I've been playing with with scanners from uh, people that I know is that most of the time the weakest part of the scanner is actually the software and my hope was that the Shining 3D software would inherit a little bit more from the commercial side of house. What you get in the box is pretty simple. You wind up basically having a scanner, a USB cable, which is what I'm holding here with it, um, this plugs basically into your computer, so you have USB on one end, the other end plugs into the scanner. There is also a power plug as well to supply power to the scanner. The scanner has an RGB camera and three VCSEL infrared projectors and a set of LEDs. This here is the scanning plate. This is basically used for calibration. Uh, when you first get the scanner, you basically need to calibrate it you do this at a number of different angles and distances, and then the back side is for white calibration as well. All right, so for this project, basically what I'm going to be doing is scanning with tracking dots and features. Um, a couple things to note on the infrared scanners. Um, in general, they don't like black surfaces. Most arcade machines are black surfaces. They also don't like large flat surfaces. Arcade machines tend to have lots of large flat surfaces. They also don't like reflective surfaces. So if the cabinet's been repainted with a semi-gloss or a gloss paint, uh, the scanner is not a huge fan of these either. So with all of these challenges, you then ask yourself, well, why pick this scanner or how are you going to actually do this? So what I'm doing here is I'm actually using global markers. Um, global markers are reflective dots, essentially, that the scanner keeps track of and it uses for positioning. These global markers I actually attach to uh, dominoes and uh, dice, um, six-sided and four-sided dice. Um, and the idea is that I can basically scatter these dice across a surface and I can then use them for tracking and referencing. Provided that I don't bump the surface or move any of the dice, um, this works out very well for my purposes. I'm not particularly concerned about scanning a perfectly flat surface or the structure. I'm much more worried about the profile. So adding the, the dice uh, for tracking purposes and uh, the extra texture on the scan doesn't really make any difference for me. So just a note, since I'm going to continue to scan these global markers for a bit, is that uh, the scanner is fairly hardware um, heavy. For requirements. Um, my original system that I started scanning with was a desktop. I was running an 8th gen i5 uh, with 32 gigs and a uh, Titan NVIDIA card. Uh, since then I've upgraded to a new laptop. It's a 13th gen i7. I have 32 gigs in that as well and a 4060 card. The tracking routine that the software uses uh, heavily relies upon the NVIDIA video card with it. Um, so as you're using it, you'll commonly see the video card not necessarily pegged, but you're going to usually be using between 30 and 75% utilization on the card. Your CPU and memory that you have tend to go towards rendering times with it. Um, so this is going to be as you have your point clouds, you make meshes, or as you're optimizing your tracking dots with it. So basically to this point, we've scanned a bunch of global markers. Uh, we've basically optimized them for where their locations are and we're now basically adjusting the lay as we get ready to start scanning the surface. So as you start to see on the screen here, there'll be a green area. 
So you see all the tracking dots, they're basically loaded, located in a three-dimensional space. And then you have your green area that pops up. This green area is basically the amount of surface that the scanner can cover at a time. And this is why I was mentioning earlier that large flat surfaces are problematic. Um, it's very easy to get your scanner in the center of a side of a cabinet and with it being large and flat it loses tracking and doesn't know where it is anymore. In this case, since my donor cabinet was the Pengo cabinet, um, literally I disassembled the cabinet, cut it in half, and left all the blocking in place to add additional structure. I was hoping to leave the blocking in place actually to assist me with the layout of the blocking later, um, which would be well represented within the scan. Between the tracking dots on the dice that we set up as global markers and all the structure that I have here, the scanner does a pretty darn good job of keeping track of where it is and maintaining orientation on it. When I do my first pass of scanning, basically I'm just trying to cover as much of the cabinet as possible, uh, and I usually try and move in a single axis direction at a time, meaning that I'll sweep left to right or right to left on it. As I get further along in the cabinet tracing or scanning process, you'll see that my orientation will change and I'll stop, start moving top down, um, left to right for, for the uh, scanning process. Um, the idea here is that I'm only getting one side of the blocking and so I need to basically rotate and change my orientation to make sure that I'm getting all of the sides of the blocking. So if you're looking at this scan, um, it also has an RGB camera, which gives you your color, which is very nice for figuring out what's going on. But as you're looking at this and you're like, well, this was a Pengo cabinet um, in the last video. Why is there all this orange? So what happens is, is that the scanner really does not like the grainy um, material of the disintegrating uh, particle board that the cabinet is made out of. Um, so when you take the T-molding out, um, the wood that's underneath it has a difficult time tracking. So what I wound up doing was I basically did a quick round of spray paint around the edges. Um, this basically eliminates the black which helps and it also helps fill in some of the nooks and crannies of the, uh, the wood around the surfaces. So the idea here is that I was hoping to get a little bit of, of a better edge scan so that I could then easier trace the uh, profile of the cabinet uh, when I start getting into the, the meshing and the 3D software. So I should also note that this video is also sped up to 2x times with it. Um, the whole scanning of this cabinet was a little over 20 minutes, um, which is significantly faster than the two and a half hours that I spent manually scanning the uh, side profile of the cabinet by hand. Um, also, when I'm doing the scanning here, I'm also getting all of the blocking. Uh, which is something that I would still have to manually measure and add to the other cabinets, cabinet measurements. So um, this is a much quicker, much faster process. So you'll see that I'm still moving back and forth, but my orientation has changed from where I originally started. Uh, originally I was working on the back side of the cabinet, uh, looking towards the front. Now I'm on the front side looking towards the back. Basically what I'm trying to do is capture as many of the angles and the edges of the blocking as I can so that I have a nice crisp edge to be able to trace around later with it. Um, I'm also trying to get the vertical supports that go up and come across uh, just for orientation purposes. As you're scanning, you're basically moving the scanner in and out uh, towards and away from the surface. Um, as you do this, you actually wind up where you should be adjusting your light values as well. So there's kind of a sweet spot where the light is just perfect and the distance is just right. Uh, the scanner also orients differently as well, so you can scan uh, perfectly parallel with the surface, or you can scan at 30 or 45 degree angle to the surface as well with it. Um, this basically almost like casts a shadow as kind of what you're seeing here. Uh, when it looks like a rectangle um, or a square, I'm directly above it. When it's more trapezoidal, I'm more scanning at, at an angle with it. And the idea here is, as I said before, is you're trying to get the scanner into all of the little nooks and crannies of the edges of the blocking. Um, the better job you do scanning here, the easier you're going to have a time of trying to trace that blocking later when you transfer it to your blueprint drawings. So we'll speed up this last little bit of scanning here with it. Um, you will note that there is some little debris that you're seeing on the outside of the scans. 
this is basically picking up other things that are outside of what I'm trying to scan. So this is another arcade cabinet that's sitting nearby, um, a footstool essentially that's holding up this panel with it. So you can very easily clean that stuff out by plane when you're done. Um, so don't really worry about it too much when you're doing your scanning. It's easy to delete. But just be aware that if you do have stuff in the general area, it may wind up showing up in your scan and will become something that you may have to address at a later time. So we finally reached the point where we think we have the majority of the scanning. Um, so now we have a 3D model of what we've scanned. Uh, this is basically as a point cloud and we can go through and manipulate the object with it. So we can zoom in, we can zoom out, we can delete portions of the scan, we can rotate things around. Um, pretty much we can uh, clean things up. Basically this is kind of our quick, easy, dirty pass to try and get uh, some of the, the extra stuff that we weren't interested in uh, taken care of. So what we're going to do next is turn the data quality indicator on. And basically what this does is this allows us to address or see how the, uh, the quality of the scan is. Anything that's in green is regarded as a good scan. Um, anything that's in red is not as desirable. Um, so the idea is that you want to have everything or at least as much as you can close to the green side of house. Um, for what we're doing here, I'm not sure the uh, supreme accuracy matters as much, but we are kind of going around the edges just trying to collect a little bit more data on the profile of the cabinet for where there's pieces that are missing. Now that we have the basic scan completed, we're going to start generating our point cloud. This takes a while, so this really depends on your processor and your memory. This scan resulted in a point cloud data or the folder was about 23 gigabytes in size. And when the STL file was made, it was about 600 megabytes. So be aware these things are huge. Also, you want to probably try and work on a solid state drive for performance reasons. All right, so the scan is done. We have a mesh that's been created. Uh, I cut out that part as it churned away for 40 minutes. And the next thing we need to do is figure out how to get the X, Y, and the Z axis zeroed out correctly with it. Um, as you're scanning in 3D space, it doesn't necessarily have a good reference for X, Y, and Z. And so the problem is, is that your scan uh, is not oriented correctly. So what we're going to do is we're going to be using a tool called GOM Inspector, which will help us zero out our, our 3D mesh that we created. We import the mesh into Inspector, and basically here's where you're seeing it um, as a shape that you can then manipulate and rotate around as you need to. As we rotate the, uh, the model, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, there's an X, a Y, and a Z axis. And as you can see, there really is no rhyme or reason on the orientation of the axis. So this is something that we need to fix. So we do this through something that we call a 3-2-1 point alignment. Uh, basically what we wind up doing is we're going to start by identifying points that are on the same plane. We're then going to identify points on an axis and then a point for our vertical height essentially. Once we do this, we click on all the points on the cabinet, so on the model. So in this case, I've done three on the surface with it. I'm now going to be adding my horizontal points. So there's my horizontal points, and then I'm going to be adding my, basically my height point, essentially. So here's my second horizontal point, and then we'll be adding the height point. And then once this is done, it will magically align to your X, Y, and Z axis for you. You can also adjust your plane size, meaning whether it's positive or negative, to figure out where you're going, uh, what, your, what directions you want to be headed. So from here, the model would get imported into Fusion uh, if you wanted to try and cut a profile, or you could basically do a screen capture with it and uh, scale it and then try and use it for tracing as well. So this basically concludes the 3D portion of this video series with it. Um, stay tuned for the next video. Uh, we'll basically be importing this into the uh, CNC software, and I'll be lining this up and comparing it to 
what I did manually in the previous video. For any of you 3D wizards out there, um, please feel free to add to the comments and advice on what I'm doing wrong and what I should be doing better. Um, the goal from here is basically to get an outline in probably Fusion 360 and then import that into my usual uh, CAD software that I'm usually running. So I hope that you've enjoyed watching this. Uh, please feel free to add to the comments. And in the next video, I'll have a comparison of the manual drawing versus the scan 3D drawing. Thank you for watching.